The blue and gold game is tomorrow, so let's compare who you and I are most excited to see when the Irish take the field for the last time before fall camp. All that and more in today's mailbag edition of Locked on Irish. You are Locked on Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on? Welcome into another edition of Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Friday, April 19th, so happy Friday, and thank you for getting your Friday started right here by making this your first listen of the day. I'm Tyler Wojak, and I am the host. I'm a Notre Dame alum and producer at Fox Sports. And as a reminder, the show is free and available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. If you are watching along on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Or if you're listening to the podcast, please take a second to rate, review, and subscribe. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. I admit it, I have a competitive side, and it is a big fan of Monopoly Go, the mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go now for free on the App Store or Google Play. All right, let's get into it. As I said at the top, the Irish play the blue gold game tomorrow. And I'll admit, I don't put a ton of stock into what happens on the field after the first half of this game. But it is still cool to see guys out there on the field, especially guys who we haven't seen before. And I think there will be some things that we learn about this team on Saturday. You don't have to think back very far uh, to last year's blue and gold game. The biggest lesson we learned from that was That quarterback competition that was ongoing, that was over because Sam Hartman ended it in that game with his performance for the gold team and Tyler Buckner's performance for the blue team. It was just not very good, and after that, it was very clear what direction Notre Dame was going to head with their quarterbacks, and then I think like three days later, Tyler Buckner was in the transfer portal, and that was that. So I don't know if we're going to see anything that definitive in this year's game, but I do think that we are going to learn a little bit about this group, and it's a nice way to sort of put a bow on this spring practice session. It is also a big recruiting weekend on campus. The Irish are hosting dozens of visitors, and I'm going to cover all of that next week. But since we are on the topic, I wanted to touch on something before we get to the mailbag questions because I actually, I missed it in yesterday's episode. The news broke like right after I finished recording um, on Wednesday night for the Thursday episode. Notre Dame's director of recruiting, Dre Brown, is leaving the program to become the director of player personnel at Illinois. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but Dre Brown uh, was a very important member of the staff, and I believe he deserves his due on this podcast. So Brown has served on the staff for the last three years, and he's worked his way up from an offensive recruiting analyst to becoming the high school recruiting director in January of 2023. And then last month, he was promoted to become the overall recruiting director at Notre Dame right after Chad Bowden, who had held that position previously. Once Bowden got his uh, promotion to general manager, Dre Brown filled his role, and it was a big deal for him and a big deal for the Notre Dame recruiting department. So on the surface, it might seem weird that Brown would leave Notre Dame to go to a middle-of-the-pack Big Ten school, and that's probably putting it nicely, but it's his alma mater. Not only that, it's where Dre Brown played. He was a running back for Illinois just a few years ago. He graduated there in 2019. That is actually more recent than when I graduated Notre Dame. I graduated in the class of 2018. So it's still very fresh for Dre Brown. And he played there. He has a stake in that program. He was a good player for them as well. So he wants to see them succeed. So I totally get it. I have a rule I believe I've been over it before on this podcast that I never a question or I never question a person who wants to return to their alma mater. It's why I was certain from the moment the Vanderbilt head coaching job opened up that Clark Lee was going to take it and return to his alma mater, despite the fact that it was a serious uphill battle and the peak for the Vanderbilt p- football program probably isn't very high. It's also why I'm always going to be a little nervous about Marcus Freeman leaving for Ohio State whenever that job opens up again. That's just me. Maybe you don't feel that way. Don't get mad at me. But I just understand the passion that I feel about Notre Dame and the same passion that a lot of you feel about Notre Dame because either you went there or you're a fan of the football program. And that passion that you feel about Notre Dame is what these other people feel about their alma maters, the team that they played for, things like that. So there's all of that in play. And also, I think Um, Dre Brown is becoming the director of player personnel there, and that is a promotion over recruiting director because you're not just focused on the high school recruits. You're you're focused on really the entire personnel department for that program. So I wish Dre Brown the best, but let's be honest, this is a loss for Notre Dame. He's really good at his job. 
there's a reason why he basically skyrocketed up the ranks from an offensive recruiting analyst to the director of recruiting within a four-year span. That's a really impressive rise, and that's why Illinois coveted him. But I am confident that Marcus Freeman will make a great hire to replace him. Being the recruiter, being the recruiting director at Notre Dame is a dream job for people in that industry. And working for a coach like Marcus Freeman, who values recruiting as much as he does, it makes it even more enjoyable and that compelling for people out there who are, you know, in different recruiting departments. Maybe they hire from within. I don't think they'll do that, but they might. I'm not really sure. I would say that the timing is pretty unfortunate, given the fact that so many recruits are going to be on campus this weekend. But um, I don't think any recruit ever has or ever will commit to Notre Dame because of Dre Brown. They're great. They're important figures in the recruiting department, but um, I expect Notre Dame will be able to hire his replacement and hire a quality replacement in short order. Okay, now let's get to the mailbag. And the first question I have is really one that I pose to the group. I posted on social media, which player are you most excited to watch in the blue and gold game and why? So I'm not going to go over every every response because that would take too long, but um, I don't really have to because pretty much all of the responses were, not surprisingly, early enrollee quarterback C.J. Carr. And I get it, especially coming on the heels of that really impressive performance he had in the jersey scrimmage just last Saturday. The hype is building. There was already a lot of hype about C.J. Carr coming into his time at Notre Dame, and now that he's actually putting it into practice on the practice field and in the stadium, because that's where the jersey scrimmage was, fans are going to get really excited. And what I'm excited about is the fact that he's actually going to be live in this game. He's not going to be wearing a red jersey. He's going to play a little bit for the blue team, a little bit for the gold team, but he can get tackled. And I think that's important because he's going to have to, you know, be elusive. He's going to have the opportunity to get tackled. And, you know, you don't want that with your starting quarterback or someone who's seriously competing for the job, which is why Steve Angeli is going to be wearing a red jersey. But Kenny Minchie and CJ Carr are going to be live. They're going to be able to show off their elusiveness. And we're going to see their running ability because up to this point, we haven't really been able to see that. But now it's going to be live. And we're going to be able to see that on display. And I think, you know, you can never really evaluate a quarterback until you see what they can do in a real live game setting. And now we're going to be able to see that with CJ Carr and Kenny Minchie as well. So obviously I'm super excited to watch CJ Carr. You know, we've seen the clips. We've heard different reports like, man, he's really good. Like Notre Dame actually has someone in CJ Carr, but it's going to be fun to see him for the first time in somewhat of a live game setting. Um, I was a little bit surprised though, on the topic of quarterbacks that nobody said Steve Ancelli and I get it. You know, we just saw him in the Sun Bowl. So like the novelty factor isn't there as much, but like Throughout last season, especially when Sam Hartman would struggle in big games, there were fans who were like, bring in Angeli, peanut butter and jelly time. But I was like, you know, if he's not playing, he's clearly not ready. Uh, and I especially thought that the year before when Drew Pine was really, really struggling. And everyone was like, yo, put in Angeli. And Notre Dame was like, no chance. So now he's a little bit older. He's a little bit more experienced. He's clearly the backup right now in the depth chart. But I'm excited to see him. I know he threw a couple picks in the jersey scrimmage, but let's see how he does in this game because there is a chance, you know, if he sticks around and Ryan Leonard gets hurt this season, there's a real chance that Steve Angeli ends up seeing significant time for the Irish this year. I did get one response from Notre Dame football enjoyer on X who said, I'll give a non-CJ Carr answer. Mike, Mike Gilbert, I think that's a great pick. Um, he's the freshman early enrollee receiver who's also been very impressive so far. And he... Uh, looks like a guy who could play this season and not because of necessity like it was last year with Jane Greathouse and Rico Flores. Mikey Gilbert can really play. Now, the room is a lot deeper than it was last year, so he's going to have to fight with some veterans uh, for playing time. But it sounds like he came onto campus physically ready to go, and he's really come a long way throughout spring practice. So I'm excited to see him as well. I also got several responses for Kingston Villamuasa, and I get that. It was really telling that he was the first linebacker taken off the board in the Blue Gold game draft by the coaching staff. It's going to be Dylan McCullough versus Al Washington. They are the coaches who drafted their teams. And um, they they both won one game. So now this is like the rubber match. And, you know, we've heard a lot about Kingston Villamuasa. We knew how highly touted he was coming out of high school. Jamie Uyayama from Irish Sports Daily said he has never heard so many positive things about a true freshman at Notre Dame in the past decade than he has with Kingston Villamuasa. So seeing him on the field is going to be really exciting, and I think we're going to see a lot of him on the field this fall. Even if he's not a starter for, throughout most of the season, he's definitely going to be uh, a big asset on that Notre Dame defense. Last couple of names I wanted to mention here, and this is just a personal thing. I'm really excited to see what Christian Gray can do on the field. I had really high hopes 
going into the spring practice that coming out of it, we'd be like, oh, Christian Gray is going to be the next Xavier Watts. I believe when I did the spring practice superlatives, that was the award I gave out to Christian Gray. The hype around him isn't quite at that level just yet, but I've still, uh, I have heard some really good things about him. Excited to see him in action. And then on offense, Jeremiah Love. Um, we found out today, or excuse me, we found out on Thursday in the draft that Jadarian Price is not going to be playing in this game. I don't have any more insight at this moment about his injury, or maybe he's not really that hurt. They just want to sit him out. Either way, he's not going to be participating. So this is a great opportunity for Jeremiah Love and the other running backs to get some carries and make some plays in this one as well. So it should be a fun game. I'm looking forward to. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. You know, it's a lot of pomp and circumstance, but there are going to be some real lessons on that football field, and I think some guys are going to stand out, and it's give it's going to give me a lot more fun things to talk about next week. All right. Now it's time for me to answer your question, so the mailbag is coming right up. Today's episode is brought to you by Monopoly Go. We've all been there, either as a player or a fan. It's halftime and the scoreboard is not looking good. You're feeling low, not sure you or your team can pull out a win. That's when you dig deep, lift your head up, and say to yourself, time to get back in the game, pull off some bank heists, and take as much of my friend's money as I possibly can. That's right, the smash hit mobile game Monopoly Go lets you compete with your friends to get the most riches and the biggest empire. It's the Monopoly you love, but on your phone anytime with tons of new twists, including leaderboards to compare your progress to your buddies. There's so much to do. You can play on countless dynamic Monopoly boards. You can make your friends bankrupt by smashing their landmarks with a wrecking ball, charge other players rent for your iconic properties, and you can even work with your friends to crack open community chests and in tournaments to get extra rewards and climb that leaderboard. So get back out there, put on your game face, and download Monopoly Go now for free on the App Store or Google Play. Today's episode is also brought to you by eBay Motors. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more... Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebay.com slash motors. eBay Guaranteed Fit, only available to U.S. customers, eligible items only, exclusions apply. All right, now let's get to the mailbag questions. And if you hear a siren in the background, I apologize. The weather is just too nice today that I'm leaving my garage door open while I tape this. And so far, it's been pretty good. But now it seems like there must be some sort of OJ Simpson-like car chase that's happening right outside my house. So if it continues to be that loud, I'll close it. But just wanted to throw that out there. Okay, first question comes from at Holtz My Beer, which is just an incredible Incredible username. Great stuff there. How necessary is it for Notre Dame moving forward to play a really difficult schedule given the expanded playoff? Wouldn't it make sense to play just a couple good teams every year from now on? If Notre Dame goes 10-2 and or 11-1, and regardless of strength of schedule, they should be in, right? Okay. So I would say in terms of making the playoffs, no. It's not really necessary to schedule um, a really difficult slate. This year could be a great way to prove that, right? Because if you look at Notre Dame's schedule right now, it doesn't look all that hard. I mean, Louisville is definitely going to be a challenge. Florida State will be a challenge. I'm sure there's going to be one team that doesn't look to be that great that will end up being a lot better than we expect or they'll just play a lot better in that game. Texas A&M on the road in the season opener is definitely going to be a struggle even though they have a brand new head coach and it's their first game under Mike Elko over there. Like, the schedule... We'll have some challenges, but overall, it's it's nothing like last year with Ohio State coming to town, um, going at Clemson, even though they weren't the Clemson we thought they'd be. So, yeah, if Notre Dame goes 10-2, and two, I would be a little concerned. I wouldn't say that if they go 10-2, and two, they're an automatic in, but I would say if they go 11-1, and one, most years, yeah, they're going to be in. But with the expanded playoff, I still think it's important to schedule good teams because you have to test your team. Like And now that you can afford a loss or two, it makes more sense to really play a really good team, challenge yourself, and see how your team stacks up against one of the better teams in college football. Because I do believe that if you go through an entire slate of games without ever really being challenged because you're playing a bunch of cupcakes, once you get into the playoff and you face real adversity for the first time all season, I think that's a negative if you haven't already experienced that to some degree during the regular season. And look at Michigan last year, for example. They cruised through the start of their schedule. It was an absolute joke 
through September and October. Then they played their first real opponent against Penn State, and, you know, Penn State offensively was a disaster last year. But, you know, it's good that they got that under their belt, and then they played Ohio State, who's an actually good team, before they ended up playing in the college football playoff. And I think the fact that they played Ohio State went a long way in getting them ready for the college football playoff, whereas the year before, they played no one all the way through up until Ohio State. That was their only difficult game. And then they got bounced by TCU in the college football playoff semifinal. Am I saying that the only reason they lost to TCU is because they played a cupcake schedule? No. It probably had to do with the fact that J.J. McCarthy played or threw two pick sixes. But you get my point. It's all sort of part of it. And I think that now that you can afford that extra loss or two, you should try and challenge yourself and get out there. Because I also think that if you do play a cupcake schedule and you end up losing one game, you know, that might make the difference. I still think Notre Dame would get in at 11-1 just because of Notre Dame and the brand and all that. And if you go 11-1, they're probably going to be ranked high enough. But, you know, if you play a cupcake schedule and you lose two games, now you might be on the outside looking in, which is not something you want to do because, you know, if you're good enough to be in the college football playoff and you just have two bad days, that would be an unfortunate way to end the season. I also think you need to schedule good games because you need people to want to go to the games and you want you need them to tune in on television. It's good for fan interest and it's good for money. Like, I'm going to be honest. I look at the Notre Dame home slate this year and I'm like, do I need to get to a game? Like, obviously, I want to go because I love going to Notre Dame games and the experience and, and all of that stuff. But, you know, with being out in Los Angeles and working in college football, like when I I basically get one weekend off per year and I get to pick uh, which one. And last year when I saw the schedule, I'm like, I call the Ohio State weekend. September 23rd, that is my weekend off. And I had to tell my boss this whole deal. But, like, I was planning for that a year in advance. I look at this year's schedule and I'm like, you know, there's not a game I have to be at. Like, I'd like to be at Louisville. I'd like to be at Florida State. But I'm not dying to get out there. And I'm sure there's a lot of other people who don't live close to South Bend who feel the same way. So I think you want to schedule those games to really build excitement, get a bunch of fans. And Notre Dame, you know, they, they're they going to sell out. But, like, they're the TV ratings aren't going to be as high. And I know that, you know, you and I might not care that much about TV ratings, but it's important in terms of getting the bigger TV deals and all that stuff from NBC so that that money can go into the football program. Like it's not a surprise that Notre Dame's highest rated game last year was the one against Ohio state. It was one of the most watched football games in all of last season. And I think that's a big deal for the program, getting that kind of visibility. So to get back to the question, no, you don't need to schedule a really difficult schedule to make the college football playoff, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't. I think you should still schedule at least two really good games that everyone's going to get excited about, and they could be staple wins that could propel your team to a deep run in the college football playoff if you're able to get a big win like that. All right, I went long on that one. I'll make this next one a little bit shorter. This one comes from at Tulsa ND 49 Finish the sentence. Joe Walt will be the best pro player to come out of Notre Dame since blank. Well, I mean, I think the easy one is Kyle Hamilton. Um, he has really made a name for himself in just his second year in the NFL. And that felt like, to me, the most obvious hit in NFL draft history. Like when Hamilton stock started to go down a little bit because he ran a little bit slower at the combine and people were like, oh, like what position does he play? He plays football. And he's awesome at it. What, what are we doing? He was amazing throughout his time in college. He was an impact player from day one. And now he's one of the best defenders in the entire National Football League. And he's going to be getting a big, big paycheck here in the coming years. Plus, he went to the Ravens, who are a great organization. Pisses me off because I'm a Browns fan. But you get my point. That was an obvious one. I think Joe Wall is going to be an obvious hit in the NFL. It looks like he's going to the Titans. That's what I'm seeing on most of the mock drafts out there. I think overall the Titans are a pretty solid organization. He will do just fine there. And I just think, you know, the way that people who really, really know offensive line, like Duke Manyweather, for example, um, some of the other guys who just really study it and understand the position, they're like, look, there is no projection that needs to be done with Joe Walt. You know he's going to be really good, and he's going to kick ass wherever he ends up. Now, if you want to expand this question out a little bit further and say he's going to be the best Notre Dame offensive of lineman sense, I would say Quentin Nelson. And, you know, Quentin Nelson has become one of, if not the best guards in the entire National Football League. So to put that high of an expectation on all is saying a lot, but I just really think 
that he could be that good. I mean, I don't know if anyone's going to be as good as Zach Martin was coming out of Notre Dame and then the career that he's had with the Dallas Cowboys. He's a surefire Hall of Famer. Um, but I think that Quentin Nelson is a reasonable projection for Joe Walt because he's just got everything you want in a modern offensive lineman. He plays left tackle. So I think the future is really, really bright for him. And plus, all the intangibles, like son of a former NFL player, he's never getting in any trouble. He's just It just seems so easy for him uh, to end up being a really good player in the NFL. So I would say either Kyle Hamilton or Quentin Nelson. Okay, next one from at Michael underscore Mancini. Which players currently on the roster do you think Notre Dame is in the most danger of losing to the transfer portal? Okay, so to clarify, I have not heard any specific guys who are definitely out the door. I've asked around. I've tried to get some insight if there's any guys out there who are like, hey, you know, they're kind of going through the motions right now at practice, but everyone knows that they're not going to be with the team next week. So I have not heard anything of that nature, and that's not to say that there isn't a player who is in that exact situation, but I'm just telling you I have not heard anything. And I'm also reluctant to name any specific players in a question like this because if they don't leave, then I look like an idiot, and I can understand why some people would take that the wrong way. If whatever I said got back to the player or the family or or the team, it's just really not a great win, right? If I say, oh, like, I think so-and-so is going to transfer, and then they do, it's like, okay, I guessed and got it right because I just told you I don't have that much information about any specific guys, Um, you know, and if I get it wrong, then it's just, it's a really, really bad look for me. So rather than giving you names, I will say some positions where I expect to see some movement. Quarterback is the most obvious one. Notre Dame has four scholarship quarterbacks right now. I would be shocked if they had four scholarship quarterbacks entering fall camp. Riley Leonard's not going to transfer. CJ Carr is not going to transfer, which means it's probably going to be Steve Angeli or Kenny Minchie. I've gone over the different scenarios there with both quarterbacks, why each one could stay or could go. I do think that if Steve Angeli decides to leave, Kenny Minchie is going to stay. I don't think that Kenny Minchie's decision will have anything to do with Steve Angeli. So it's it's a unique situation. I do expect one of them to leave just because it's the quarterback position. Guys transfer out um, who are quarterbacks at every single school around the country, and they have been for a long time, well before the transfer portal was on, uh, was ever a thing because there's only one guy who can be out there playing quarterback unlike most other positions. So I'm guessing one quarterback. I would also guess that we'll probably see a wide receiver leave. Jets, that's another deal where it's like the nature of the position. If you look at all the players who enter the transfer portal, um, wide receivers are one of the highest just because there's a lot of guys, and I think it's just the personality that it takes to play wide receiver. You always want the ball, and if you're not getting enough playing time, you think that you deserve more, you think that you better, they're better than you actually are. Hey, I played receiver. I get it. So I, I would not be surprised if we saw one or two guys leave there. It's a pretty deep room, and Mike Brown, the new receivers coach, said he's only looking for like a six- to seven-man rotation. So I could see some guys at the bottom of that trying to get out and find some more playing time somewhere else on the offensive line. I think you're probably going to see a few guys who like aren't on the two uh, aren't on the two deep, but realize uh, they are probably better off going elsewhere if they want to see some playing time. I don't think anyone in, on the two deep or anyone who projects to be a starter one day at Notre Dame is going to leave. But that's sort of just natural attrition. That's good, right? If the guy's really not making a dent, you don't really want his. Um, scholarship spot on the roster anymore so could see a couple offensive linemen I also I mean defensively I think I don't I'm not reluctant to say his name because he's already stepped away from the team but Tyson Ford is a guy who um, I wouldn't be surprised if he entered the transfer portal Marcus Freeman said he's stepping away from the team for personal reasons right now he's got some stuff to figure out usually when guys do that they probably end up leaving I could definitely see Tyson Ford hitting the transfer portal um, after spring practice as well also He is not on the two deep. You haven't really heard any um, significant progress from him in getting playing time. He only played like 10 snaps last season, so that one would not shock me. Um, Running back, if we did see a running back leave, it would be a slight surprise but not a shock just because the room is so deep, it's so talented, and there's only one ball. So um, I don't want to speculate, but that is something that I could see happening at running back, just given the fact that there's so many guys in that room and it's a really, really talented group. So if you're that talented, you're probably like, hey, man, I could be getting a lot more uh, touches somewhere else. It reminds me of like Dylan Edwards last year. Edwards is the running back for Colorado that was committed to Notre Dame at one point and then flipped once Deion Sanders got the job. Like in that first Colorado game last year against TCU, he's out there 
scoring four touchdowns. And I'm thinking, man, if he had stayed at Notre Dame, there's no way he'd be getting any playing time this year because he'd be sitting behind Estime and Price and um, Jeremiah Love probably as well. And then he's at Colorado scoring touchdowns. So I get it. Um, if these guys want to leave, get more playing time, I wouldn't be shocked. But those are the positions that I'm expecting to see some movement. Uh, most of all, if another one ends up coming up, I wouldn't be that surprised either. It's transfer portal season, man. It's crazy. There's going to be a surprise. That would be my my biggest prediction. There's probably going to be a player who, who enters the portal. You're like, what? But so it goes. All right, we got a few more questions left, including the time I was most wrong about a Notre Dame team. Stick around. The Locked On NFL Mock Draft is available now. Find the ultimate six-episode series on Locked On NFL Draft to hear who the local Locked On experts are picking for every NFL franchise with live reactions from local college football experts and even a fantasy football angle. The Locked On NFL Mock Draft is available now on Locked On NFL Draft on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace for Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. With great last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, GameTime takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. I recently used GameTime to go to a Dodgers game. It wasn't really even in the plans, but then I saw how cheap the tickets were. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go. I'm going to go watch Shohei Otani play some baseball. GameTime is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. You can see the view from your seat and your phone before you buy. But my favorite thing about GameTime is the pricing shows your total costs up front, and you can buy tickets in a matter of seconds with just two taps. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time download the game time app create an account use code locked on college for twenty dollars off your first purchase terms apply again create an account redeem code locked on college for twenty dollars off download the game time app today last minute tickets lowest price guaranteed okay just got a couple more questions left this next one comes from at joe joe and four three four or maybe joanne d four three four i'm sorry i didn't really get that right you and other media types <laughs> that's kind of a funny way to put it you and other media types are very high on the Irish this year. I'm skeptical. What year were you most wrong about your preseason expectations? Okay, kind of a negative question, but this is an easy one. It's 2016. Like, I thought Notre Dame would take a step back after 2015, but it, I, I did not expect they would take that kind of step back. Um, but, you know, I, I really still to this day, I don't understand what happened in that 2016 season. It felt like every single game they had a chance to win, and then they just blow it in the end. I think of the eight losses, seven of them were one-score games with the uh, USC game at the end of the year, the lone exception. that I mean, the team had just given up at that point. I, I don't even know how much of that game I even watched because I think I was at like the Louisville-Kentucky game. Either way, that was a disastrous season. Um, thank God the Cleveland Indians, the team formerly known as the Cleveland Indians, uh, made a World Series run that year because I was so down about Notre Dame football, but then being able to follow that run really is the only thing that was giving me life because that was just so disappointing. I remember me and some of my college buddies went to that season opening game against Texas, and it was such an awesome weekend, and like going to Austin is really cool, the stadium, all that. Really, really fun place to visit. If you can ever get to a Texas game, I'd encourage you to go, but probably not the first weekend of the year because it was so ungodly hot and the game was really exciting the back and forth all that was great Notre Dame ends up losing it in overtime you got Joe Tess saying Texas is back me and my buddy Charlie were sitting in the Texas student section we had to hear it the whole way out of the stadium and that was just the beginning of what was a really really long season for Notre Dame fans and I thought they'd be good I never expected 4-8, and eight, but they, at least they were able to bounce back next year uh, in 2017, my senior year, and had a good season after that. But yeah, 2016 was just really, really bad on, on all accounts. All right, last one. At Eric Lowe. I'm bringing a friend to his first Notre Dame game this fall. I've been many times, and I know campus like it's the back of my hand, but what are three places not on the campus that you think are essential for anyone visiting for a game weekend? My first bit of advice Eric, would be to spend most of your time on campus on a game weekend. It's the absolute best. I love walking around. I love that you can feel the energy and you just know that it's a big football weekend. Like when I was a student there during big, big weekends, you could start to feel it on like Wednesday. There'd be a buzz. There'd be some people coming in. You'd be like, oh, a little bit more people on campus. There's some news stations. ESPN is here. Like that buzz is just intoxicating and it makes you so excited. And, you know, even if Notre Dame is playing Little Sisters of the Poor, the vibes around campus on a game day are going to be fun. People are going to be out. They're going to be having a good time. So I would say... You and your body should spend most of your time on campus. But when you're off campus, um, I think there's a couple staples you got to hit. 
if you're getting a beer, you got to go to the linebacker. And I think I've said this before. I really didn't even go to the linebacker that much when I was in college. You know, they're pretty strict about fake IDs, all that. But ever since, uh, big friend of the fro- uh, big friend of the program, the Falkenbergs now have a stake in the linebacker. I'm going there every single time I go back to campus. Shout out to the Falkenberg family. Um, and also, the linebacker is a staple. It's been around for a really long time. If you're if you're on uh, if you're in South Bend for a game weekend, you know it's right there. It's kind of right off the corner. Uh, man, I'm losing. I'm forgetting the names of the streets because I haven't been able to get back as much. But it's kind of by like the softball field right off, right across that main road there. I think it's Angela. Yeah, it's definitely Angela. Wow. All right. I'm back. I'm back. Angela Twickenham. It's at that corner. And uh, it's just the best. It's like, you know, your classic shitty dive bar on a college campus or off a college campus, I should say. But everyone there, they're just diehard Notre Dame fans. It's also so cheap. You get a massive beer and uh, it's just the best. Vibes are great, especially on a game weekend. We had so much fun last year. I think Shane Gillis, the comedian, showed up with uh, when we were there at the backer. And then there was just like a huge mob around him. But if you're getting a beer, go to the linebacker. If you're getting food, go to uh, go to Rocco's Pizza. That's a local South Bend staple. I love it. Um, it's also cool to go there because they've got a bunch of memorabilia and old Notre Dame photos on the wall. You could just find yourself staring at the wall for like 10 minutes because there's so much cool stuff and like so many great moments in history that they have captured on the wall. Food's great. Service is great. Can't recommend it enough. But I'm not going to lie. Outside of those two places, like I don't know if there's any – staples off campus um especially during a game weekend like i don't think there's a ton of sightseeing in south bend uh but that's what i'm saying keep most of your time on campus or around campus i would say if you're into golf try to get on warren uh that's the golf course like just outside of campus at Notre Dame. Although I have never golfed there during a game weekend, it might be impossible. So maybe I'm giving you bad advice, but I imagine it's very, very difficult to get a tee time on Warren the weekend of a game. But hey, give it a shot if you're into golf. Um, you know what? For a tailgate, I will say that I I pretty much always tailgate in the parking lot right next to Notre Dame Stadium. Fortunately, I, I know other people who host big tailgates. Um, but one thing that I've always wanted to check out was the RV tailgate, which is just off campus. It's by some apartments and Irish crossings over there right off Twickenham. And, like, it looks cool. I always, I would I would walk by it um, from my place when I was a junior in Irish crossings, and we'd always walk by, and it looks like they're having a good time. I've never actually stuck around and, like, partied with those guys, but it looks like a lot of fun. So if you want to venture off campus to do some tailgating, maybe try the RV lot. I just can't say it's an essential because – I have never been. Okay, that's going to do it for me today, and that's a wrap for this week on Locked On Irish. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. Remember, subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you're listening to the podcast. You can also follow the show on X at Locked On Irish or on Instagram at Locked On Irish Pod. I'm going to be honest. I've been slacking a little bit with the social media presence uh, for those accounts. Just busy, a lot going on. I put all my effort into recording these actual podcasts, but I made a promise to myself to be more active on those accounts. So go give them a follow. You can also follow my personal X account at Tyler, W-O-J-C-I-A-K. Have a great weekend, everybody. I'll see you next week.